So here's the exam schedule, and um, it says that any classes that meet at 3 o'clock and after are examined during the first regularly uh, scheduled class meeting. So since we meet on Tuesday and Thursday at 4, what that means is that we'll have our exam at 4 p.m. on uh, the 25th, Tuesday, April 25th, 4 p.m. So we'll start at our normal time, but it'll go a little bit longer because you'll have two hours for the exam. Um, so as far as announcements go, um, the project is due on Thursday. And um, I've gotten some good questions about that. Um, but I wanted to mention one thing. And um, if you have like kind of conceptual questions about the project, I'm happy to answer those questions. But um, I want to be a little bit careful about basically troubleshooting the spreadsheet for you. Because then I feel like maybe you're not getting the same learning experience that you would if you were kind of applying the assumptions yourself. Um, I guess put it another way, I don't want to be like a, a co-author of your project. I, I, want you, I just want to see what analysis you come up with on your own. And so if you have a question of interpretation, I'm happy to answer that. Or even if you want to check your final answer, I'll give you a yes or a no. But um, like during the, the remaining days of the semester, I'm pretty hard pressed with a lot of catching up on grading and stuff and so I'm not going to be able to get into debugging people's spreadsheets for them. So I'm just going to have to draw the line at that. But in any way, uh, the project is due Thursday at 4 o'clock. Um, today we're going to be talking about uncertainty, which is kind of a, a new exciting topic for me to be able to teach because this is not a, cla a topic that I've included in very much detail before and I'm kind of excited by what I've put together. Um, just one last announcement related to the exam. If we look at the uh, schedule for the semester, I wanted to point out that the exam is cumulative and it's going to include topics from the entire semester. So if we look at the uh, schedule, which is included with the syllabus online, um, the final exam we're going to have includes more questions, relatively speaking, on the more recent topics. And so proportionally, there's going to be more of the points earned on topics since midterm exam two. But there will be questions through the entire semester. And so it may be a good idea to review the in-class exercises from the entirety of the semester, going back through your homework assignments, and just making sure that that's all still fresh in your mind. Um, as far as uh, what to bring with you to the exam, you should bring your laptop computer because there definitely will be some questions where you need to use Excel. And you can also bring three formula sheets with you. You can bring uh, a formula sheet related to material from the first midterm exam. You could just bring the same one if you like. Another formula sheet allocated to the material from the second midterm exam and then a third from the last. And so. Um, you can use the front and back side of three pieces of paper. And then I'll also provide you with any factor tables that I expect you to use. And so you don't have to copy down any kind of factor tables. So any questions before we start talking about uncertainty? All right. Well, um, here is a, a picture. Does anybody know what city this is? Does anybody, has anybody seen the Netflix show Drive to Survive? Nobody's watched that one. Do you know what that show is about, Drive to Survive? You don't even have a guess? It's about Formula One. OK. That's in Italy. It's close. It, that, what'd you say? It's Monaco. Oh, yeah. yeah. Monaco is the, the region, the principality, and the city is Monte Carlo. So yes, that's Monaco, Monte Carlo. So the reason why I wanted to show you a picture of this is um, one of the things that Monte Carlo is famous for, besides having very low taxes and being kind of like a, um, a haven for rich people, um, there are a lot of rich people who make their home legally in Monte Carlo because they don't have income taxes and it's kind of a way to shield 
themselves from paying much tax. So a lot of the drivers, for example, in Formula One supposedly live in Monte Carlo, which means that they maybe have an apartment there, but they don't actually spend much time there. It just for legal purposes, they live in Monte Carlo. So for one thing, it's kind of uh, renowned for tax avoidance. But then the other thing that Monte Carlo is famous for is gambling. Um, maybe not as notorious for gambling as like Las Vegas or, or maybe Atlantic City here in the United States. That's what we maybe think of as the gambling meccas. But um, as far as uh, like a, Europe's focus for gambling, Monte Carlo may be it. And the reason why I bring it up is that a lot of the study of probability um, goes to people with a background in gambling. And the simulation that we're going to do today is called a Monte Carlo simulation. And it got that name from a, a couple of statisticians who studied the probability of roulette and other gambling games to try and understand what is the expected value that a casino could make or what is the expected uh, losses that may occur for somebody who has um, a certain number of tries at a table. So the Monte Carlo simulation is a way of just applying a lot of uh, variations and seeing what is the, the outcome and the value of those variations. So rather than talking about the theory of it, I think for today what we're going to do is just jump straight into some calculations. And uh, Angelica, do you have any questions? No. No, okay. Um, so let me show you the in-class exercise that we're going to look at today. The first thing we're going to do, just to kind of uh, clear away the cobwebs, is I'm going to ask you to um, calculate the total present value when we know the purchase cost of some equipment, the number of years it will last, our interest rate. So this should be review. The first part of this in-class exercise, part one is just completely review, although it's been a while since we did it. Hopefully you'll find it simple. And we're going to do this just so that I can make a point about maybe how simplistic this kind of a problem actually is. So let me pause for a moment and have you find what's the present value of this business opportunity. If you buy it for 50000 the equipment lasts for six years. Each year there's a net revenue of 11500 and our interest rate that we discount those future revenues at is 5.1%. Okay, so it's always a good idea to draw a cash flow diagram, and that kind of sometimes will remind you what it looks like and what we're doing. So you buy some equipment for 50000 and that's at the present. We already know that present value is 50000 And then we have uh, six years, so one, two, three, four, five, and six where the annual series is 11,500. Let me write the numbers on there. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the interest rate is 5.1%. So you're going to find the, the, the present value of that revenue. So there's going to be some present value equivalent of it, of the revenue, which you combine with the 50,000. So the 50,000 is an outflow, so that's a negative amount when you're trying to find the value of the overall project. You find the present equivalent of the revenue. So Jake, I heard you say that you did discount the, uh, the revenue and got 58,000, then subtracted the 50,000, and that's correct. Yep. That's right. So let me just uh, pull up the solution for that. Okay, so our factor that we calculate is uh, the P slash A factor 5.0595. So if we multiply that by the 11,500, then the present value 
of that future revenue is 58,184 and 25 cents. And then we combine it with the amount that's already at the present, which is the outflow cost. So what we should have is a, a total present value of $8,184.25. Okay. Any questions about this first part? Raise your hand if you can predict the future. I can't. Yeah. Um, so think about what are all of the things that could be unpredictable in a situation like this? Well, things that are now are a little bit easier to predict than things in the future. But if you wanted to buy something now, if it's a big piece of equipment, you don't even necessarily know what it's going to cost. Um, you know, like, I can see that the new Toyota Prius has a retail cost of $34,000 or whatever. But if I walked over to the Toyota dealership, I, I don't know what they're actually going to want for the car. There could be some sort of a uh, Toyota-thon going on. There could be a, a dealer markup that applies because the inventory is so low. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, market factors and demand could drive the typical price up or down, and that's just things that are already at the present. The future is even more uncertain. So look at all the ways that this is kind of a simplistic and almost like a silly way to even think about a business opportunity. So we don't know how much it's actually going to cost. I mean, unless we already have like a, like a promise contract. But if we're just in the preliminary stages where we're evaluating an opportunity with some rough figures, that 50,000 may be subject to variation. How long is the equipment going to last? Well, there's certainly variation in that kind of thing. Sometimes equipment lasts longer than expected. Sometimes things break down early. I mean, maybe six years is an average value, but I think we have to, if we're going to be spending $50,000, we have to consider all of the possibilities, not just the middle of the road average possibility. Like, what's the worst case scenario? What's the best case scenario? Can we put some bounds? around the possibilities, the range of likely possibilities, investigate the variation and what impact that has. So the revenue of 11500 So what if right now we're the only person in town doing this thing? The equipment that we're getting, maybe it's like some sort of an asphalt paving equipment. But then what if somebody sees we're making nice profits and now there's three other people with that equipment and maybe the revenue I'm able to earn goes down because there's an overabundance of supply of whatever I'm going to be doing. So predicting the future is tricky. So I don't know necessarily what my net revenue is. Maybe that is a, a possible amount, but it might not be guaranteed. And then the last thing that is a, a little bit uncertain is the interest rate. I, I mean, maybe most of all, you don't know what the interest rate in the future is going to be. I mean, like even six months from now, people are racking their brains and uh, following every word, every comma in statements from the Federal Reserve Bank trying to figure out what's going to happen, and nobody really knows. So what we're going to look at in part two is an investigation of, like, what are the range of possibilities that could occur if there's uncertainty in all four of those parameters. What if the purchase price varies? What if the useful life varies? What if the amount of inflow that's coming in varies and the interest rate? So all four of those things could vary independently. What if we get lucky? What if the purchase price is less than we thought? What if it lasts longer than we thought? There's actually more revenue and the interest rates are lower. There may be this perfect like alignment of the stars where all of that happens at the same time, although maybe it's a pretty small chance uh, likelihood. So we're going to investigate all that with um, this part two. All right, so if you flip over the uh, next side of the paper, 
I want to set the stage about this before we open up Excel and start doing some calculations here. Okay, same scenario with the same baseline values. I've just added a little bit of additional information. So the equipment cost on average is 50000 and based on our research, we think that there's a 67% probability that the equipment will be plus or minus 2,000 of that. Now, the 67% thing you maybe remember, have you ever taken a statistics class before? Uh, if you've taken a statistics class, you probably remember the idea of a normal distribution. Normal distribution is the idea of a so-called bell curve where there is some average value and then there is some value where 67% of the probability is within one standard deviation, so meaning on the lower side and the higher side, there is some certain distance Standard deviation, I'll just abbreviate it, abbreviate it SD. So standard deviation is how far you have to go from the average where it is 67% if it's both sides. And so that's like 33% of the probability is from the average out in the plus direction. 33% of the probability is below the average. So what we're saying is, on average, we think that the equipment is going to cost 50000 And then it may be 2000 more than that. So that would be 52000 It may be 50, oh, sorry, 48000 And it could be even more than 52000 like, there's a chance it could be 53, 54, but it's a much smaller chance. Like, most of the probability is within this range of 48 to 52,000. So, like, 67% of the time, the price is going to be within 48 to 52. But sometimes it'll be even less or even more. So, any questions so far about the equipment cost? So, the two ways that we're going to describe each one of these parameters is by its average value and its standard deviation. And so we're just assuming a normal distribution here and we're saying how far out from the average we have to go for the majority of the probability. So for example, the useful life of the equipment. It has a one year warranty. So that's all the manufacturer is, is willing to promise. But looking at other, other people who've had similar equipment, it seems like on average it lasts about six years. And then 67% of the time, it's within plus or minus one year of that. So again, we've got an average and a standard deviation. So the average is six, the standard deviation is one. The revenue we think is going to center on 11,500 and then we have defined the standard deviation so on either side of that is going to be the majority of the probability. And finally the interest rate. Right now it's 5.1 percent and uh, we think that it could vary within 0.9 percent and then that would represent 67 percent of the probability. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and have each one of those four variables varying and we're going to do 10,000 simulations to find out if we have 10,000 simulations and each parameter is varying according to that average and standard deviation then what is the average profit how often will we be losing money when it's profitable how much profit will we be making when there's a loss what's the average loss amount, and then what amount represents the 90th percentile of profits. Meaning, you know, like, if you say, I want to know, like, I'm feeling very optimistic. I think I can beat the odds. I want to know how much is the profit I can earn that there's only a 10% chance that I'll get that profit or higher. 
So we're going to look at all four of those uh, cases. Uh, I'm sorry, vary, varying all four variables and answering all these questions. So start up Excel, if you will, because we're going to do this. Instead of doing all 10,000 by hand, which would take us too much time, we're going to do 10,000 in Excel, and we'll easily finish it by the end of the class meeting. All right, so just starting with a blank workbook. Um, follow along as I type in the following. Okay, so we're going to do average cost. Uh, oh, actually, no, just average, not average cost. Average and standard deviation. So here we're going to have across the top the first cost, and then we're going to have the revenue, and then the n value, and then a space, an extra space, and then the rate. Okay. So, for example, we know that our average first cost is minus 50,000. Since it's a cost and an outflow, I'm going to put the negative sign there. And the standard deviation is 2,000. So it's, it'll do plus or minus 2,000 on either side of this average. Okay, our revenue is 11,500 for the average, and our standard deviation is 12,500. No, 1,000, what I say on the handout? 1250? 1250, okay. 1250, okay. Okay, the equipment will last for six years on average, but the standard deviation is one year on either side of that. And then our average probability interest rate is 0 0.051, but it could vary 0.9% is the standard deviation. So 0 0.009 is 0.9%. OK, now, if you flip over the back side of the paper, it shows across the very bottom some of the tools and functions we're going to use today. These are new ones that you maybe haven't seen before. So um, we're going to do something that uh, well, we'll do it in a minute that is pretty unusual. Um, let's first just do simulation number. One, two, three, four. Just maybe extend it down through like 20 for now. OK, so we're, we're going to first just start off with 20 simulations. OK, this one we're going to do cost. So what we want to do is we want Excel to randomly pick um, the cost. And um, so it's going to be an embedded function where we say equals norm inv. And that norm inv function is going to be kind of like a probability distribution. So norm.inv and then start the function. And it wants to know like what it should use as the seed for the probability. And what we're going to do is a function equals rand, R-A-N-D. So clo open close. The rand function, just let me show you the rand function by itself, equals rand. So it randomly picks some number between 0 and 1. So if you see this rand, sometimes it's below 0.5, sometimes it's above 0.5, but it's just randomly generating some number. So it's a random number generator. So what we're going to do for the cost is we're going to, we want it to generate a random cost centered at 50,000 and varying plus or minus 
2000 as the standard deviation. So equals norm dot inv probability equals rand comma the mean should be 50,000. So select that and then anchor the reference because we're going to drag that down. And then the standard deviation, just click on the standard deviation amount and close parentheses. Angelica, are you following this? Yes. Okay. think so. Uh, I wonder what I've forgotten here. Do you have to put the double equal? Well, this is unexpected. Maybe I don't think it would be because of Capital mean standard deviation. Okay, let me just try typing the numbers then. So 50,000 and 2,000. All right, I'll take away the dot then. Norm inv with no dot. Well, I wonder if maybe I just don't have the. Well, I mean, I did something. But I don't know if it's right. But if the instead of you put like the equal sign before rand, mm -hmm. you have to do that. I think you do. Let me just open up. I've got my solution that I did uh, earlier today. Let me just remind myself what I might have done wrong. It works. Norm oh, no equal sign. That's what it is. OK. All right. So sorry about that. All right, so what we're doing is equal norm dot inv. Now rand, uh, parentheses, the mean 50,000, and anchor the reference there, and standard deviation, anchor the reference there. All right. That's a relief. All right, so this is just randomly selected 49,446. But if you drag this down, you'll notice that every one of them is different. And did you notice how the, the first one changed when I dragged it down? Anytime you make any change, all of these is going to update. For example, see how it says 1 here? If I just type in 1 again and enter, it's going to change all of these. So anytime you make any change whatsoever, it recomputes every formula in the whole cell. And random, every time it recomputes, it's getting a different number. So that's why anytime we make any calculation, all of these data are going to change. So because of that, I think just to uh, save us the aggravation of having our numbers change when we may not necessarily want it to, we're going to turn off that automatic calculation. Uh, before I show you how to turn off the automatic calculation, so does everybody have this cost so that it's just randomly generating it? Huma, have you got it? No. Okay. We don't have to have the same numbers, right? No, you yeah, definitely won't have, have the same numbers. But you have negative? Like yeah, I have okay. some negative. Now anchor the references with the dollar signs. You don't? No, I don't have negative. I don't know why. Do you put minus 250? Uh, did yes. you do it in front of the... Um, just drag it down. Okay, oh, good. Yes. Okay. Everybody else got it? It doesn't have to be the same, right? It definitely won't be the same because of that random number generator. Everyone will have different numbers. Anytime you press F9, it changes it. So you can just press F9 over and over and over and it will recompute and give you different values. Okay, Victor, have you got it? Yes. All right. 
So we've got the cost and it's randomly changing. Let's turn off that automatic update. So if you go here to formulas, calculation options, and manual, okay, now it'll only calculate if we tell it to. Like if I type in one, it's not going to calculate it again until I press F9. Then it will calculate. Okay, so we've got our randomly generated costs. Uh, by the way, I wonder what is the average of this? I mean, we just to check really quick, we could say average of these values. It's probably going to be close to 50,000, but it won't be exactly 50,000. Look, 50,551, if I recalculate again by pressing F9, 50,300, 50,500. So anytime we press F9, it'll recalculate. But with only 20 tries, it's never going to be exactly 50,000. That's why we do 10,000 simulations is to get closer to uh, true probability. But with 20 samples, it's not. Okay. So the more simulations you run, the more it's going to approach that average value. Exactly right. Yeah, you'll, so we'll do that again. We'll calculate an average after we have 10,000, and it'll be close to 50,000, much closer than it is now. So like when we were doing it just now, it seemed like it was like maybe 50,500, you know. It was, it was varying around a little, bit, a little bit. Okay, let's do the same thing and have a random distribution of revenue. So here's going to be the revenue. So we're doing equals... Um, norm INV, norm.inv, parentheses, rand, parentheses, okay, the mean should be settled on the average with the dollar signs by pressing F9, the standard deviation centered on the 1250 F9 with the, or F4 to anchor it. Now, see how it's copied and it's all the same? It's all the same because it hasn't calculated yet. So when I press F9, then it'll calculate for all of them. Okay, let's do random uh, n values. So this is going to be n value that's, it's going to be n as a decimal. So n dash DEC, I'm going to call like my decimal number of years. So equals norm.inv rand and the mean will be 6 the standard deviation will be 1 okay and drag that down through 20 of them and calculate with F9 so the problem is we can't really use the decimals in a meaningful way, like equipment can't last for 6.5 years if we apply the end of period assumption where everything gets paid out all at once at the end of the useful life. So we're going to calculate an integer n value. So this one is the n int, integer, instead of decimal. And so for that one, we're going to use the round function so equals round, and we're going to round off this to zero digits. So just round off the cell that's to the left of it to zero digits of precision. And uh, so you'll see, for example, 6.53, it rounded to 7. I dragged that down. It's saying 7 to all of them because it just didn't calculate yet. But if I press F9 then it'll, it'll round off each one to the nearest number of integers. Dr. Wade, this might be a dumb question. <laughs> Bless you. Um, for, your, for your n decimal mm -hmm. column, if your standard deviation is only one, mm -hmm. how is it possible that you have values returned like that are, that are eight point something, or four point something, or three point something? Because it's not saying that seven is the limit. It's just saying that there's a 67% chance that the values will be between 5 and 7. I got 
Gotcha. So, so there's a 34% chance, 34% of the time the value should be either higher or lower than okay. seven or five. Is there a way to change that percent, like to exceed seven percent, or is that yeah. just regular standard deviation? That's the definition of standard deviation, okay. yeah. So there are other functions where you can have a non-normal distribution, like the world doesn't always follow a normal distribution like this. Sometimes the data will be more like, you know, maybe it's like that. Maybe there's, like they call that a long tail, where here's the average, but there's a lot more that are low and only a few that are high. But just for simplicity, we're going to go with normal distribution for this Monte Carlo simulation. So you'll notice on the cost and the revenue, it was also doing the same thing where sometimes the data is, is more than 52,000 in minus. So you notice here's one that's minus 52,686. And so that's beyond the one standard deviation range. Uh, here's 46,000. So that's really small. But there's not very many of them that are 46,000. So that's a pretty rare thing that the cost would be that low. Okay, let's do the rate now. So let's populate the, uh, the rate probability. So again, we're doing equals norm.inv with rand on the inside for the probability. The mean located at 5.1% and the standard deviation located here. Mm -hmm. For some reason, when I do the revenue and the N, the standard deviation, I'm getting the same number as I bring it all the way down. Yeah, if you press the F9 button, then it'll calculate and it will vary all of them. So it's just because it hasn't calculated yet. So if you, did you press F9? Did it calculate them? Yeah, but it's only changing like one cell. And then as I bring it all the way down, it just... Yeah, so look at how mine. It's all the same as I bring it down. It's all the same, but when I press F9, it calculates and gives me a lot of variation. Okay. It doesn't work for me. I think yeah, so what you should do then is go I into formulas. Automatic and that's yeah, how I did it. Or you could just click calculate now. You could switch it to manual, and then here is calculate now, calculate now, calculate now. Your end value should only be like mm -hmm. single digit numbers. How, how did you get such high numbers? Okay, so simulation one. What if we had to pay 50860 Each year our revenue is 11815 It's going to last for six years, and our interest rate is 5.156. So then what is the present value of of that. So let's say the total PV in that situation. So it's going to be equals PV of, okay, so for rate we're going to click, here's our rate. For NPER we're using this integer amount. The payment is comma minus of the revenue Okay, so that is going to tell us the, the present value of the revenue, and then we need to add the cost, which is already at the present, to find the total present value. Now remember, your amounts are different from mine, but this is just like some scenario when that was the cost, this is the revenue, and so on. So I got that the present value would be 8,811. What values did you get? I got 
10,000. That was a lucky year. Sean, what did you get? 11,000. 11,000. You're even luckier. Anybody get more than 11,000? I got 22,000 for my second one. For the second one? My second simulation. So, so you've dragged it down beyond the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's drag it down from all of them and then recalculate. So F9. Sometimes it's negative. So sometimes it shouldn't always be negative. Is yours always negative or just sometimes? Yeah. The first one was negative? Yeah. Yeah, look, so here I've got one that's 28,000. That's my best case scenario. And my worst case scenario is losing 9,506. That's a pretty big spread, right? But remember how we don't have enough simulations. 20 isn't enough. Because if we only have 20 simulations, then even just the cost isn't landing in the average. We know that the average for the cost should be 50,000. But let me add one more line here. So I'm going to watch this. We're going to insert a row right here just so that we can uh, calculate the average. So equals average. And then I'm going to select this range. So right now, my average is not close to the average. So it's because I don't have enough simulations. So let's do this. Let's drag it down through 10,000 tries. This may take a second. So if you drag down 1,000, 2,000, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Come on. Oh, I got through 12. I went too far. So I only want 10,000. And I want it to be exactly 10,000 for a reason that I'll explain in a minute. Let's do 10,000 simulations. Oh, almost there. All right, 10,000. OK, now we want all of these. We want 10,000 costs, 10,000 revenues. So luckily, we don't have to drag down that slow way many times. We just can double click on that green corner, and it takes it all the way to the bottom. So just have it go all the way to the bottom for all of these. And then I'm going to tell it to calculate. So you can either press F9 or calculate now. Hey, Dr. Wade, mm -hmm. for, the, uh, for the average, how do you, uh, this, this is probably a simple thing, but how do you go all the way down to 10,000 without? Yeah, um, without it being annoying? Yeah. Let me show you. There is, there is a pretty cool trick. So just delete the one that you had before. OK, so equals average, E-R-A-G-E, OK, parentheses. Now, use your, your arrow. You've got like a down button on your keyboard. Go down and start on this one. And now, on your keyboard, press Control and Shift at the same time, and then down again. And it goes all the way to the bottom of the list. And then you can just try type Enter. Got it. Or, or or you could do the math, like, you know, if it starts at B7, then you could just type in through B10,006, because that would be a list of 10,000 numbers. But I like that one where it's control, shift, down, arrow. So now the average is 50,020. So that's much closer to what it should be, which is 50,000. OK, so let's look. What are these questions we're trying to answer here? Um, what is the average profit? OK, so go into the simulation and our average profit. So that's the, uh, the PV, the total PV. So let's find out the total present value. So uh, the average of that equals average. Across 10,000 simulations, my average is 7,927. 
What values did you guys get? I want to I want to have them all on the board so we can see the distribution of numbers. So I had nine seven. I'll just, we'll just do whole dollars. Uh, se I'm sorry, seven nine. Seven nine two eight. Seven nine two eight. All right, Sean, what did you get? Eight seven five nine. Eight seven five nine. Wow. Angelica. Okay. Victor. Okay. Let's see. You need to have 19 and 20 selected and then you write it down. So it was just copying the same numbers. So if you have 19 and 20, uh, oh, so you want to have a negative K now? No. No, just only, only select 19 and 20. Honestly, I couldn't tell you why. Otherwise, it could start a different pattern. Okay, so now you can see it's increasing. And not the future value of Do you have a question? No. Because the cost is already to the present, so you, you can just straight up add that cost. I, I think that should fix it. Okay. Why did you get the average? That's okay. Look, I have one negative thirteen thousand. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So now do them all. You can just double click and it will go to the bottom. PV is what you want to see. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, getting, I'm getting an average of maybe 10,000. Oh, you added the cost. Right now, again. update. That's so like now. Mm -hmm. after the payment. How oh, do you get to this house? This house is racked, and then you add <laughs> your cost. How many are you at right now? You can just double click on that. Oh, you can just double click. Oh, so you're just trying to do yeah. the average, average yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so equals average. Parentheses, uh, control, um, maybe try control command down. I don't know on the back how you do. Yeah, I don't know what the keyboard is. So what you have to do is look at the numbers. Now do colon, colon. He, he did it. He did averages for, for pretty much everything. Four. Like the cost, the revenue. Ten thousand six. That, but, but I did. Yeah. You know, it's one thousand. Yeah. I'm not sure. Why is it Let me pause the recording. All right. So I've got seventy nine twenty eight. Sean had eighty seven fifty nine. Jake, what did you get? One six or six zero? One six. Angelica? Seven nine seven two. Victor? Seven nine nine three. Sid? Eight five four three. My value is really different. Okay. What is it? It's forty nine nine eight four. Four nine. Nine eighty four. Oh, he's he's talking about the total PV. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. So you that was the uh, the cost right. that you had. Yes. Yeah. So if you do the same thing, so you'll notice that it's kind of maybe averaging around eight thousand, maybe eight thousand one hundred. If you did the average of those values, and if you just calculate over and over and watch. What is it bouncing around? You know, like if, if I see, if I did it 10 times, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, then like I've got 10,000 simulations times 10. So now that gives me 100,000 simulations if I just did the average of this 10 times. That saves me some having to drag down <laughs> through 100,000 rows. Um, okay, so let's look at some of the questions that this was asking us. What's the average profit? Okay, so for me, I'm saying that the average profit is 79. So we don't have to do the 10 times? No, 
No, because this is just saying 10,000 simulations. And if you go down through 10,000 rows, then this is going to be your average for 10,000. And all of us will have different values, but that's OK. Like, if I flip a coin 10 times, I'm not going to have the same sequence of heads and tails as you. But even though it's the same coin and the probability is the same, the outcome isn't the same. If everybody here flips the coin 50 times, you're going to have a totally different sequence than any other person. Even though the probability is the same, the outcome is different. So the average profit, 79.50.1 for me. Okay, what percent of the time will there be a loss? Okay, this is an interesting question. Um, let's do a, uh, a calculation where I'm going to do... Yes, we're going to use a, an embedded if and count. So um, let's do here is going to be my, uh, no, just number with a loss. And here I'm going to have the number total. OK, so equals count, so count if if this is greater than no if it's less than 0 okay so it will then it will uh, return a 1 otherwise it'll return a 0 hmm i'm wait a minute how did i set this up before let me just remind myself how I did this earlier. I'm like a deer in the headlights at the moment. So it was an embedded count if less than 1 and 0. Yeah, that's the same, right? Um, but how do I have the range, though? Oh, OK. Yeah, it was the range. OK, if count if. Oh, it's an embedded. The, the function itself is count if. OK, so equals count if. Yeah, for this whole range, so using the shift control down, count it if it is less than 0. Too few arguments. Oh, I think I need a comma. So count if is the range. The criteria is if it's less than 0. I'll get there eventually. I think maybe what I need is parentheses. Uh, quotations, that is. OK. Count if, and we're going to do the range. So it's G7 through G10,006. So that's the range part of the function. And then the criteria is quotations less than 0. I don't know why that needs to be in quotations, but I guess it is. OK, so that is the times that there's a loss. And then the total is just count 10,000. So then the percent of the time that there's a loss is going to be um, the number with the loss divided by the total number times 100. So this is percent of the time there is a loss. So I have 23.5% of the time it's going to be losing money. Does anybody need to see a certain function again? Yes. Yeah. Which one? OK, so I'm, I'm only doing uh, count if. It, it's, it's not an embedded function. So equals count if. Oh, oh. It's, own function. Yeah, it's not the if inside of the count function. Gotcha. I'm doing count if. So then you select the range. 
and then comma, and then the criteria is parentheses if it's less than zero. And if I recalculate, still pretty close to 23% of the time it's a loss. 23, 23, 23. I guess that's consistent at least, is it's pretty close to always 23% of the time losing money. So did you repeat the range for the criteria too? Like did you do the range and then the range again for the criteria? No, the criteria is just is just the quotations less than zero. Okay, and if you press F9, it'll recalculate and give you maybe 23 or 24. 26. Okay. No, she'll just have to type in the numbers. The keyboard is different on the Mac. There probably is some equivalent, but figuring out what it is is. What were you trying to do? The F9 function? Um, no, um, writing down the number. Okay, so now we have answered what percent of the time there's a loss. So, what percent of the time is there a loss? I'm going to say 23.35%. Uh, when profitable, what is the average profit amount? So like this average of 8,000 includes both the profits and the losses. So let's just have a column that says, if it's profitable, what is the profit? And then we'll have another column that tells us if there's a loss, what is the loss? Okay, so this is gonna be an if equals if so if this is greater than zero, then make it that amount. Otherwise, if I just leave it blank, it'll say false, I think, if it is below. So like, for example, and then I have it calculate, F9, it'll just say false anytime it's not above zero. So I can drag that down through all of them calculate. So my average profit when there is profit is 12,355. And if I have it find the losses, then it would be equals if this is less than zero, make it the amount. Otherwise, it'll just re return false. So it will only give me amount in the case where it is negative. So it's giving me the, the, the average loss. And again, I can calculate the average there. So on the handout, it says, when it's profitable, what is the average profit amount? For me, 12,400. When there's a loss, the average loss amount is 6,060. Of course, it's always in between. It, it, it's not like it's going to be in a loss, it's going to be exactly 6,000. That's just the average loss that you could experience. Any questions on uh, C or D of the handout? There's just one last thing. We've got four minutes remaining. And so it's asking what amount is there a 90% chance that you'll make less than that amount? So let's select the total PV. So you go down, control, shift. So select it all and then copy, control, C. And what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to paste a copy of the data, but I want to do a special kind of paste. I just don't want to paste the data. I want to paste the values. So paste the values. 
And um, so in pasting the values, that what that'll allow us to do is it'll allow us to sort the data. And even if we recalculate the rest of the workbook, it'll stay sorted. So it pasted the values. And now over here on this ribbon is a button where we can sort from largest to smallest. So we want to sort from the biggest number to the smallest number. And so like my best case scenario is 59,763. What's the probability that that's how much I'll make? It's at the top of the list. It's the number one value out of 1,000. So I have a 1 in 1,000 chance to make 59,763. That's not a very good chance. Like, what's my 1% probability? There's a 1% probability that I'll make 44,711 or greater. It's because that's my 10th value. So 44,711, there's a 1% chance I'll get that much or more. Um, what about the 10% chance? So if I go down here to my 100th value, so here's 100 out of 1,000. No, uh, how many simulations do we have? We have 10,000. So I need to go down to the 1,000th value. So if I go down to the 1,000th value, then that represents 10% probability. So if I go find number 1,000, there it is. 22,314 and 80 cents. So there's a 10% chance that I'll make that or more. So that's what's asking in, um, in question E. It's saying, what is the amount where there's a 90% chance that you'll make less than that amount? So there's a 90% chance that I'm going to make less than 22,314. So I guess this is just another way, this sorted list is another way to see the extent of the data. Like if we keep going down and down and down, we're going to eventually get into the negative values. But like, what's the threshold for that? How many of the times is it negative? Well, 76% of the time it's positive, And then the other remaining probability is negative. So all these are like the ordered list of the losses, like what's the worst case scenario loss? I could lose 29,031 in the worst case scenario here out of 10,000. So there's a 1 in 10,000 chance that I'll lose that much. So that is uh, Monte Carlo, the idea that what we're doing is we had a random variation in four different variables, and then we had combined them together to see like what's the range of possibilities. Does anybody have any questions about this before we go our separate ways for tonight? OK, so just to remind you, um, the project is due on Thursday. If you have like questions related to concepts on that, or if you want to check your answer, we can do that. But um, otherwise, I look forward to seeing what you've come up with. Remember that it would help me if you kind of explain your fifth scenario. Scenario five, which is like your personal values, I'd like to know um, like a, a brief summary of the expenses that you have in mind and the uh, savings that you have in mind. Just It doesn't have to be a lengthy write-up, but just a, a brief explanation of, of the fifth scenario. So that's it for tonight. I'll see you on Thursday.